Amen. Thank you, Joel and Chelsea. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be with you. It's good to open up God's word with you and to say, Lord, we are listening. What, what do you want to speak to us this morning? And um, we had a great first service. I think God's going to meet with us in special ways in this second service. If you have been with us uh, for well over a year now, we have been studying a letter called Ephesians, which is a letter from a guy named Paul to a church in Ephesus. And he has been just shredding us with beautiful truth after truth after truth. And by the way, um, I know I'm going to say this and there'll be like this, this great uh, angst that rises up in the crowd, but, but we are nearing the end of the book of Ephesians. I'll just pause so everybody can, okay. So we are, we are actually coming on to the last page, okay, of the book of Ephesians, which if you remember where we are and where we've been and where we're going, Paul begins by saying, this is who you are. And he closes by saying, we are in a battle and this is how you fight. Okay, we are going to close with, with a battlefield and the armor of God. And, and, but before we get there, uh, I've, I've just had this sense that, that I don't want to move into that too quickly without reviewing a little bit where we've been and specifically where we've been uh, for the last couple months. So let me, let me just give a, a broad review of the themes of Ephesians. For many of you, you know this, but let me just... Let me just lock a few things in our mind from this letter as a whole, okay? Can I do that? Can I do that for a moment? Four major themes of the book of Ephesians. Identity, unity, maturity, warfare. Identity. So, so Paul is going to start out in chapter one and basically look his audience in the eyes and say, it is essential as a follower of Jesus Christ that you know who you are and whose you are, okay? It's essential to remember some of these truths. Like, for example, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are adopted by God, all right? You are an adopted son or daughter. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But I don't, don't gloss over that too quickly. You have been bought by the blood of Jesus, set free, forgiven, transformed, living in the victory that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. That, that's amazing, all right? You've been sealed by the Spirit of God. You have the Holy Spirit within you, guaranteeing he will finish what he started, all right? Paul says, I want you to know who you are. Chapter one, moving into chapter two, he says, I want you to know that you have been saved by grace, through faith. Don't gloss over that too quickly. Like, you've, you've been rescued out of that old life, and it wasn't, it wasn't like anything you did so that anyone would boast and say, look how awesome I am. You've been saved by grace, through faith, and it's the gift of God. And Paul says, hey, and we got to know collectively, like as a body of Christ, who we are. He says in the end of chapter 2, he says, you let me say a truth. Some of you will struggle to believe this. You are the masterpiece of God. You are his workmanship, like his work of art. God has made us as one big, messy, beautiful community called the church. And God looks at us and says, that's my masterpiece. To display the works of God through the world. He says, we're the body of Christ. By the way, uh, we're a body of Christ, so all these different little body parts, meaning a church and the vision of the King Jesus is not a crowd watching a show, watching a couple people with gifts up here. No, he's like, we're the body of Christ, and he's our head. This is who we are, okay? It's who we are. We got to know who we are. And then secondly, the second major theme is unity. And Paul basically says, hey, if we are all adopted, redeemed, saved, forgiven, brothers and sisters of the living God, there is a natural application that we must live in that is different from the whole world, okay? Let me ask a ridiculous question. Is the world living in unity? No. And then there's this thing called the church, and we're different shapes and sizes and backgrounds and even little different theological preferences and all these different things all coming together. And yet, when the world looks at us, they're supposed to see that there's something radically different about them. 
They are the people not arguing on social media, not throwing spears at people that they don't like in their, in their fellow community. They are the people that are radically united. Why? Because of Jesus. And when the world looks at this group of community and says, why, why would you be united? Why are you so humble, gentle, patient? What is it? They'll say, there's something different about them. It's Jesus Christ. We're meant to live in unity identity, unity, and then he moves to the next major theme, which is maturity, meaning we're meant to like go deeper. We're meant to grow up. We're meant to not like skim the surface and just kind of live in this shallow Christianity. Like every aspect about our life is meant to deepen and deepen and grow and grow in Jesus. We're meant to have a mature church, chapter four. Uh, we're meant to have mature relationships with believers and unbelievers, chapter 3 and 4. We're meant to have maturity in our relationships. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then when he's done with that, he's like, all right, before we're done, I'm dropping you on the edge of the battlefield. I'm strapping on the armor of Jesus, and I'm claiming the victory. This is how you win. And then the letter's done, Okay. And I would love to do this for a moment. I would love to review <clears throat> the last like eight weeks of sermons, okay? Which, which if you've been with us for about, like the last eight weeks, we have been walking through some of the most significant relationships in our life. Okay, we've been moving like in concentric circles. We've, we've spent several weeks talking about marriage and what it means to be a godly husband or wife or for the singles in the crowd, what to look for in a godly husband and wife. And we moved out a circle and said, all right, how about godly parenting and grandparenting? What does it mean to, to live out the dream of the heart of God for our families? And then we moved out last week, one more concentric circle, and we said, what about the workplace? Like, what about, and we kind of delved into cautious ground that we had to be careful of because because Paul addressed masters and slaves and we said of course God hates slavery but is there something about the heart of God that we can extract out of that in this authority relationships where we can reflect the heart of God we made a bridge into our workplace and said how do we have these working relationships with bosses and employees that reflect the heart of God all right and so I just want to kind of give a, a broad summary real quick before we go into an essential truth this morning. So you can either go back and listen to the last eight sermons, or you can listen to the next eight minutes, because uh, I want you to have a big picture, like, truth tied all together of where we've been before we look to an incredibly important truth, okay? Okay, so let me start out with the first relationship, marriage or husbands and wives, Basically, this is what we looked at for a month. Let me just kind of summarize. Paul said husbands, and he gave this groundbreaking, script-flipping truth. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Meaning, you try and you will fall short of this all the time. You repent a lot, but make it your living aim to say, I will display Jesus Christ to her. Just like Jesus loved us, served us, pursued us, sacrificed for us. I'm going to make it my aim to be the living display of Jesus. Or here's the truth. I'll love her like Jesus loves me. And said wives, and it gave another like incredibly profound, have to wrestle with the truth. He said, wives, you are. Honor your husbands, respect your husbands, even submit to your husbands. And let me kind of wrap it up in one big thing and basically say, you love your husbands as you would Jesus. All right? And the essence of this whole, this whole truth is husbands, if you love her the way Jesus loves you, wives, if you love him the way you would love Jesus, when the world looks at this thing called marriage, they will see that the focus is Jesus and it's a display of the love of God. If you're here in the crowd and you're saying, gosh, one day I would like to be married, can I tell you the truth of God's word for you? Marriage is not this thing created by God to make you happy. 
It's something created by God to bring your focus to Jesus and to display the love of Jesus to the world. It's about the gospel, all right? God loves the gospel of Jesus, all right? And then he moves out of concentric circle to parenting. And here were the truths of parenting. Basically, he said, parents, you love your kids the way God loves you. Meaning, and if you remember the truths, he said, do not provoke them to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So look at me, just like God loves us, disciplines us, uh, teaches us, instructs us, is patient with us, um, guides us. He's like, hey, parents, you display that to your kids and to your grandkids in such a way that they would look at you and they would sense the Lord. And it says kids and even like adult children. He said, this is what the basic truths were. Obey your parents in the Lord. Honor and respect your parents as you would the Lord. Look through them and treat them like, so let me summarize, ready? Parents, you love them the way Jesus loves you. Kids, you treat them the way you would treat the Lord. And in a Christian family, uh, Jesus becomes the focus and the display to the world, okay? And then one other concentric circle. He says, let's, let's flip the script on, on workplaces. If you are somebody who is a boss and has people that, that reports to you, like do you have any employees that kind of look to you or volunteers that report to you or coaching staff that look to you or students that look to you? Uh, or do you have anyone that you report to? Any like principal or athletic like in charge of that, or like, or like, this is your boss, or this is your, you know, this is your, like, whoever it is that you would report to, you honor them, look to them like you would the Lord. And in all ways in your workplace, Jesus can become the focus and the display in these concentric circles. Okay, can I pause now? And let me just acknowledge and validate something, okay? Maybe as you've listened for the last eight weeks, or maybe as you've listened for the last eight minutes, something in your heart says, I want that, truth be told, in one of those circles at least, I'm far from that, all right? Like, like I'm longing for that, but, but what is the starting point? I don't, I don't feel like my marriage is this like awesome display of the love of God, or I feel like a bit of a failure with how I've raised my kids, or, or my workplace is an absolute mess. How shall I then live? Like, like, what do we do? And so before we enter that last little page of Ephesians, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to pause. I want you to go back to a truth that is the burning center, I've called this, of Ephesians, okay? I'm going to go back to chapter 5, and I'm going to show you, just like picture this for a moment. If you were to take an anchor and drop it in the water, it would be anchor, ripple, 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 right, of, of water. Here's an anchor truth that we're going to go back and look at at chapter 5, and how it hits each of these concentric circles. Chapter 5 flows into chapter 6. So I want to go back and look at the Spirit-filled life, chapter 5, and how it flows into each of the relationships of our life. Does that make sense? It was a long intro for an awesome message. How does living a Spirit-filled life overflow into marriage, family, workplaces? And how is it the glue that I think, according to Paul, kind of holds it all together. All right? Can I just pray for us? And then we'll read a power pack text to us. Uh, you, just like we're saying, God, you can have it all. Would you breathe on us and bring your life to us, God? Father, I pray that by the power of your spirit that you would fill this and teach us Allow me to fade. Now, like I prayed in the first service, God, I picture the scene of Elijah building this little stone altar and, and pouring water over it. 
And then saying, God, it's just, it's just a bunch of rocks and water unless you send your fire. And so I take these notes and these thoughts and all that you have talked to me about all week. And I ask you now to send your fire and take your truth and light it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 5, verse 17 uh, through 21. Let me read it to us. Ephesians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. By the way, isn't that an attractive sentence? Like, Lord, I want, I want to know your will. Like, if this is going to cascade into marriage, family, work, like, what is your will, God? Because I want to live in your pleasure. I want to live in your heart. I want your will to be the shining focus of all I do. All right. Paul's like, you got to understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he says this, okay? He says, this is the will of the Lord, basically. Watch this. Anchor command of this text. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, Paul's going to start out, and he's going to say, let me give you an illustration that um, you may understand. Hopefully not too many of you people understand, but, but nevertheless, here's his illustration. Ready? Do not get drunk with wine. So if you've been drunk or if you uh, have people in your life that you can picture right now that, that are drunk, here's what Paul is basically saying. He's saying, don't do that because when somebody is drunk, here's what happens. All right? Someone is yielding their life to an outside influencing agent that causes a person to respond different, to walk different, to sing different, to potentially dance different, to act and speak and sing and live and whatever, differently when you are influenced by an outside agent that changes things. And Paul is using that as an illustration. He's saying, hey, by the way, don't do that because if you do that, if you live a life yielded to that, it leads to debauchery, which is a Greek word for a scattering of life into the wind. He's like, don't do that, however. But like that, like that, there's a way to follow Jesus Christ where we daily yield to the Holy Spirit of the living God who can change the way that we respond, who can change the way that we live, who can empower us and infuse his life in us and through us to speak and act and love and live differently. Paul's like, don't, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to a life of just wastefulness, but like that, you be yielded to the spirit of the living God who will also change things. And the point that I'm going to make throughout this message is the way to approach marriage or future marriage or kids and grandkids or even workplace is to begin by saying, I want to be yielded to you, O spirit of the living God, to live a life in me and through me that I could never do on my own. A spirit-filled life that cascades into spirit-filled relationships. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Okay, what's that mean, to be filled? Um, I said this in the first service. I feel very old saying this. Okay, ready? 25 years ago, I was in a seminary class. Um, 
and I was assigned this Greek word, prerao, uh, okay, to be filled. I had to do a 70-page exegetical paper on what that means. And I would tell you this, like, I'm kind of like a word study kind of guy. Uh, throughout my last 25 years of being a pastor, this word I have studied more than any other word in the scriptures, okay? And I don't say that, hear this loud and clear. I don't say that to be like, so I got this one figured out. <laughs> I got this one. I say that to say I have, I have wrestled with God's word and asked him to help me communicate this for 25 years. I've studied it and untangled it, and like, like studied it and studied it, and, and it's still a bit of a mystery to me, to be honest with you in communicating this concept of being filled. Um, I think of this, I think when Nicodemus asked Jesus, they were having a conversation in the Holy Spirit and Nicodemus was like, I, how do, like, how do I understand this? And Jesus doesn't make it super clear to him. He's like, it's like the wind, Nicodemus. Glad that clears it up for you too. <laughs> you see its effects, you feel its presence. But you don't know where, where it came from or where. He's saying there's some mystery to this. There's some mystery. So let me tell you, um, as studying this and, and looking at all the original word concepts, I want to give you a few images which I think most clearly communicate what it means to be filled. Okay, I'm going to paint three quick images for you. Okay, here's the first. Picture lungs being filled with air. Picture taking a deep breath and your lungs being filled with air. And here's the key. When they are filled with air, oxygen infuses your blood and infuses your body, empowers your body to function as it was created to function when your lungs are filled with air and therefore oxygen animates and infuses life into your body like it was meant to be. Okay? Picture lungs filling air. Here's a second one that I think is helpful. Picture a sailboat with a mast that is filled with air and therefore not floating or needing to be rowing, not rowing in effort or floating aimlessly, but a mast filled with air and therefore empowered or moved to do something that it couldn't do on its own strength, okay? Being moved by the power of the wind. Okay, can I give you a third one? This is also essential. All right. This filled word is a relational kind of word. Um, it's not like this glass of water is half full or, or a quarter empty. That's not, that's not what it's saying. If I were to say that person is full of himself or she is full of herself, what would I mean by that? Okay, here's what I would mean. It would mean like, he is sort of like influenced or dominated by his own will, his own agenda, his own goals. Like that's driving everything because he's full of himself. He's full of his own interests or his own goals. Okay. The night before Jesus was crucified, he looked his disciples in the eyes and he said, I'm leaving, but good news for you. It's going to be better. And they're like, how could it be better than you here? Jesus said, it's going to be better because I am sending my Holy Spirit and he will indwell you. Not only that, he will be your helper. He will be your guide. He will convict the world of sin and he will do this. Please don't miss this. I love this. This is John 16, verse 14. Can I have it on the screen? Watch what he said. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Meaning like, what, what is the role and the passion of Jesus, of, of the Holy Spirit? To glorify Jesus, to point to Jesus, to take the attributes of Jesus and the fruit of Jesus and to manifest it through our lives, to, to make it in us and through us. To point to Christ so that the world would worship Christ and listen to Christ and, and to point out God's word to us so that it would illuminate Christ, to declare it to us, to take the things of God and to say, I want the interests and desires and agenda and goals of Jesus to be lived and seen in you. I don't want you to be full of yourself. I want you to be full of Jesus. 
Does that make sense? Um, on my, uh, where Ashley and I live, right down the road, there's this beautiful white house. And this white house next to it has this beautiful white barn. And you can drive by it at night because there's this spotlight that illuminates the barn. And it just, it just displays, like it, it, it glorifies the, the barn, if you will. And the role of the Holy Spirit is, watch this, don't miss this, through your marriage to bring out and glorify Jesus. Through your family to bring out and glorify Jesus. Through your workplace to bring out and glorify Jesus. And our goal is to be like I know this is a little bit mysterious, but hang with me. Like lungs that, that are infused with the Holy Spirit of God who's bringing forth Jesus into our life. Like a sailboat with a mast that is being moved by the power of the Spirit of the living God. Like one, like a spot, like showing forth Jesus Christ in our lives. That's what it means to be, to be filled with the Spirit of God. Okay, so... Um, so question for you, here's, here's a major question that people ask all the time, which is how do you be filled with the Spirit? Like, how do you do that? How do you, like, thank you for those pretty images, sailboat and lungs and blah, 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 but how do you live a Spirit-filled life, okay? Um, I'd love to give us, if you're taking notes, I'd love for you to take notes. I'd love for you to write down these three words and spend some time really meditating and reflecting on these three words, okay? Because I think this is, this is good for the how of what I'm talking about, okay? Here's the first word, repent. Here's the second word, yield. Here's the third word, listen. To repent, to yield, and to listen, okay? And the way I think, it helps me remember this, if I sort of tether these words to sort of, I don't know, body parts to make it make sense, to make it visual, okay? So repent, or to have a clean heart before the Lord, all right? Or my heart is clean before God and others, all right? Well, it wasn't mean to be filled with the Spirit. How do you live that? It has something to do with a daily, even an hourly, repentance of a clean heart before God and others, okay? Second one, second one, yield to have open hands, a surrendered will, a, a full surrender yielding of my heart to whatever your will is, God, in my marriage, in my family, in my workplace. God, I'm an empty vessel surrendered to you. Clean heart, open hands. And then the third one would be listening ears, okay? To hear the voice of the Lord, to hear the illumination of God through his word, to understand the heart and will of God and to respond in our daily life. I think throughout the scriptures that when you see clean heart, open hands, listening ears, those are all attributes of living out the spirit-filled life. So I just want to unpack each of them for a moment. Okay, so, so here's the first one. A clean heart, okay? A clean heart. Part of the very call to follow Jesus is to daily, and listen to me, even hourly, sometimes even for me to be real with you, it's like more than hourly. It's like every 20 minutes or so to be like, God, is there anything in my responses, in my actions, um, in my attitude that's not pleasing to you? Because I want to confess it to you and others. Holy Spirit, the one who, who convicts the world of sin, have full access to convict me. Is there anything in my life that is not like pleasing to you? Any action, any response? Convict me because I want my heart to be clean before you, Lord. All right, let me show you this verse. This is 1 John uh, 1, 7 through 9. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you have this daily and even this hourly decision. Are you going to walk in the darkness or walk in the light? And God's like, my life thrives in the light. And so the role of the Holy Spirit in our life is to continually highlight and press on any attitude or action or response that is not in the full light and love of Jesus so that we would say, God, I, I confess it. I, I repent. I repent and that I want my heart to be clean before you. Can I tell you something about my marriage and my parenting? Honestly, at least every other day, and I would say usually every day, okay? There's at least a moment where either me or Ashley has to look at each other and say, I, I just had to do this yesterday. I'm sorry. I feel the conviction of the Lord for how I've acted before him and before you. Would you forgive me? I think it was like two days ago. She was like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be so harsh with you. Would you forgive me? And when I repent and have a clean heart before God and her, and when she repents and has a clean heart before God and me, we live in the light and the spirit-filled life cascades into our marriage. Can I tell you something about raising kids? I've, I've studied this a lot lately, okay? And I have seen this boldly in counseling lately, okay? Your children do not need to see their parents living this perfect parenthood that never fights and never screws up. In fact, I would argue this. If your kids grow up and think, my parents never really fought, it might actually mess them up one day when they have their first all-out blowout fight in marriage and they're like, I guess we're falling apart. I didn't know this was real. Listen, listen, statistically, like with very valid statistics, your kids don't need to see you live a perfect life. But one of the most powerful things that you could ever do is to pull your children aside and say, guys, last night I, I disrespected your mom. Will you forgive me? The way I just treated you guys and how I disciplined, I lost my temper. Would you forgive me? When your children see you repent, it comes in the light and the spirit-filled life cascades into the relationships of your family. What would it be like to be in a workplace where you as a leader with employees reporting to you are quick to say, God, is there anything in my responses? Have I disrespected anyone? Have I offended anyone? Did I respond too harshly or, or not in the spirit of the living God and to repent and to confess? What would it be like to live in a house with five other girls and you're continually saying, I want to live with my heart clean before you. When you live with a heart clean the Spirit of God and the light just takes over. Can I tell you the second one? Um, a clean heart. Secondly, open hands. All right? A surrendered open vessel. Let me read to you this next verse. This is Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is what it's saying. You be a living sacrifice, meaning, meaning you say, God, and I've had to do this a lot in the last 48 hours, actually with my family. Um, I, won't, I won't tell you what it's about, but there's something that's been just recently happening in my family, and I've been like, God, I don't understand this, but I know you love me, and I know you're for my sons. Like, I know you love me, I know you're for us. And so therefore, though this is mysterious to me and I don't understand, I surrender it to you. My hands are open to you, Lord. All throughout the Bible, the spirit of the living God fills empty vessels, all right? When the temple was empty, God filled it. When people have empty vessels of hearts saying, God, you can have it all, God has a way of filling it. I think one of the greatest things you can do um, each day with your family, with your marriage, with your workplace, is to say, God, though I don't understand it, I continue to surrender it to you. I continue to yield it to you. Have your way, God. All right? God tends to fill the empty sail that's asking for the Spirit to fill it. Okay, and then the third one. Remember the third one? Listening ears. 
okay? The night before Jesus was crucified, he looked at his disciples and he said, I'm sending you a helper, the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you the guide who will guide you into truth. And our relationship with the Holy Spirit is meant to be one where he's helping us, where he's guiding us, where we're listening to him. Um, this last week, for example, this is going to sound very uh, maybe nerdy to some of you, but every morning I've been in the minor prophets uh, throughout, throughout the Old Testament. I've been studying Obadiah and Nahum and Zechariah and, and all these like ancient prophets that are very difficult to understand. But I've been looking and saying, God, I want to hear your voice. I want to know your word. I want to hear what you're saying. And God has been revealing truths to me that have guided me and blessed me and taught me. And then throughout the day, I'm like, Lord, I'm listening. I want to hear your voice. Nudge me by your spirit with what your heart is. And this process of just listening to the Lord is how we're supposed to walk with God. And so I ask you, it's like, hey, David, um, I thought you said we're going to be talking about relationships of marriage and parenting and workplaces. Are you saying that if we live lives with clean hearts and open hands and listening ears that that affects the relationships in our lives. Everybody look at me. Yes. And watch what happens when we're filled with the Spirit. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5. There is an effect when we live the Spirit-filled life. Can I just go Greek grammar on you for a second? Um, this text says, be filled with the Spirit, which is the dominant command. And then it lays out participles, which are the commands that are kind of subjugated, like underneath the dominant command, which means this is what it looks like when you're filled with the Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me give an illustration. I did this in the first service as well. Um, I'm looking around for my CPA accountant people because usually I use sports illustrations. All right, Adam Klaus, you're my guy. All right, ready? If I were to say, this is the last time I'm ever using a CPA illustration. If I were to say, do your taxes, participles, assembling your receipts, turning in your giving report, giving it over to the CPA tax collector person, those are the participles that describe what it means to do your taxes. Adam, can I get an amen? Thank you very much. Okay. This is saying, be filled with the Spirit, and when you do, these are, these are the verbs that go along. Like This is what it looks like when somebody is filled with the Spirit. Okay, Be filled with the Spirit, and it starts out, and it says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Okay, first category. When you are filled with the Spirit, when you have clean hands and like clean heart, open hands, like surrendered will, listening ears, when you're filled with the Spirit, there is a worshipful sense of your life. Like you're sharing with, with each other what God is teaching you. You're, there's like, it doesn't mean we have to be like, I don't know, walking Spotify stations or something, but, but there's this singing overflow of our life. Like if, if the goal of the Spirit is to show the spotlight on Jesus, it would make sense that he is taking this life that is yours and causing this worshipful presence to point to Jesus. Worshipful. Here's a second one. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's gratitude. Look at me. When I am not filled with the Spirit, which I'm often not, and, and, and followers of Jesus, you can be a follower of Jesus Christ and yet not be yielded and empowered and filled with the Spirit of God. Do you know that? And when you're not, like times that I'm not, here's a first indicator. Gratitude is not overflowing in my life. I'm living more critical, more harsh, more looking with kind of a negative edge. And when you're filled with the Spirit, when you are fully yielded to the Spirit of the living God, He causes a certain thankfulness, giving thanks in everything, like, like your reflex becomes gratitude. 
Oh, that you would live marriages where, where you are the central source of gratitude in your spouse's life, where you just model gratitude. I know with Ashley and I, when one of us are struggling, the other one comes forth with the things that we're thankful about, and it rises us up, all right? To be a source of gratitude in your workplace. To be filled with the Spirit so that, and people see thankfulness in you. Do you ever think that one of the greatest like evangelistic strategies that you can have in your workplace is to be a thankful person? Not like conjuring up thankfulness and faking it. No, yielding to the spirit of the living God, saying, I want to be surrendered to you, clean heart before you. Anything in my life, God, that's not pleasing to you? Okay, I confess it. I surrender. Take over, Holy Spirit, and watch gratitude cascade out of your life. And people look at your life, and they're like, there's something different. Oh, yeah, it's gratitude. Oh, yeah, it's Jesus. That's what happens when they see the Spirit of God in you, all right? And then finally, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This word submitting means something like, like there's a way that, that I like to think of it, which is I'm third, meaning God's first, I'm gonna put others second, I'll be third. When we are submissive, when we're putting our employees above our, ourselves, when we're putting our spouse above ourselves, when we're living with this spirit-directed submissiveness, we're living a spirit-filled life that overflows into our relationships. Um, I'm going to close with two things. One, um, I've had these words in my, in my little journal this week. I'm just working through it, and I'd ask you to do the same thing. I've just written the words... Clean heart, surrendered hands, listening to you, Lord. And then I've written the words, the, the overflow of the Spirit-filled life. Am I worshipful? Am I thankful? Am I third? And I've just been working it out. Like, like, what does that look like in my life, in those relationships? Like, am I willing, first of all, to be repentant, meaning clean heart before God and others? It means probably... I'm often saying, hey, have I hurt you? Have I offended you? God, is there anything in my life that's not pleasing to you? Because I want to live with a clean heart. Do that and watch what happens in your relationships. Spouses, uh, when's the last time you looked your spouse in the eyes and said, I am so sorry for my responses? Make repentance a daily part of your family or your people that live with you in your house, whatever it is, live with clean hands. I've written the word gratitude. I, I want to be a husband. I want to be a boss. I want to be a dad that lives with the overflow of gratitude in my life. Um, I want to be submissive. I want to put others before myself. I want to be, I walk with these guys in my little morning discipleship group, and we leave every group saying, what will we share with the truth of Jesus that he's taught us that we can share to others? What would it look like if the aspects of the spirit-filled life were like an anchor that rippled into the relationships of your life? And let me just, let me just close like this. I want to close with uh, something that I felt like the Lord taught me this week out of the book of Zechariah. Um, and I realize that many of you probably haven't been in the book of Zechariah for a long time. So um, let me share with you just this simple little Bible story. Um, there was a governor by the name of Zerubbabel. Isn't that a great name? And Zerubbabel was given this task that he was longing for, but he didn't have the ability to do in his own strength. Okay? God, through Zechariah, told Zerubbabel, I want you to rebuild the temple, okay? And he's like, I want that, but I'm overwhelmed by that, okay? By the way, can I just speak that into some of your lives? Um, when it comes to a marriage or a family that would honor the Lord or a workplace, do you ever go through the feeling of, I want that, but I, I'm not sure, what, like, even where to start? And then Zechariah said this to Zerubbabel. It's just this 
beautiful text. It's in Zechariah chapter 4. This is what he said. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Meaning, you are not going to do this in your own strength and your own power. But I'm asking you, Zerubbabel, to lean into the spirit of the living God who can do something through you that you can't do in your own strength. And then he said this, look at verse 7 and 8. He said, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, meaning the Spirit of God will knock down the obstacles. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of his house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Look at me, in your own effort and strength, you can't make a Christ-centered, Christ-displaying marriage, family, or workplace. But God would have you know, lean into his spirit, be filled with his spirit, and let him do things in and through you that you can't do on your own strength. And one day, he will get all the glory, which is all we care about anyway. Father, I just pray that you would do this in us. I pray that you'd work these truths in us. I pray that our hearts would be clean and our hands would be surrendered. Um, I pray that we would hear your voice and, and live out uh, what you're calling us to live. I pray that these truths would be present in our lives, God. Lord, we love you and we need you. We can't do this in our own effort. I thank you for Jesus. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. And we're going to close with uh, communion, which is just a time to, to humble ourselves before the Lord, to say, Father, I want to examine my heart. Is there anything you're pressing on me? Um, and it's a time to remember. It's a time to remember that the night before Jesus was crucified and this very night that Jesus said, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Jesus pulled out bread and wine and, and started doing something that would last forever. He took this bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. It'll be broken through you and in my brokenness will be your path to hope. Remember this. Remember that my body broke for you to make you whole. And then he poured wine and he said, this is the cup of a brand new covenant with my blood, which I will shed on the cross. I'll buy your freedom. I'll set you free. I'll forgive your sins. Drink this, remembering that that's what I did. All right. So I want you to spend some time with the Lord. Like ask him to press on your heart. And then, like, go up and take communion. And if you're in one of our prayer teams, I'd love for you to, to join the sides. And in the back, there's communion stations in the back and on the sides. People would love to pray for you. If you're here today and you're like, I've got a lot of head knowledge when it comes to the Holy Spirit, but I have never experienced the Spirit-filled life, living a, a surrendered, dependent life sales full of his presence kind of life. We would love to just pray that for you. You're not meant to live life alone. Jesus said, I'm sending you a helper, a guide to empower you. And so we'd love to pray for you. Spend some time with the Lord. When the moment's right, would you come on up and, and take communion? Uh, let me just pray. God, would you meet us in these moments? Would you speak to us? Would you commune with us? We take th this meal to celebrate you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.